We had never been in combat. We had a bunch of naval gunfire. They pre-shelled that and strafed it with aircraft, the beach there that we were landing on. And I didn't think there could be a mosquito left there, you know. And I couldn't imagine I was up there going to shoot down somebody who was just a boy. They say war is hell, but I, I say it's devastating, it's cruel, it's just terrible. I thought, man, alive, I'm still alive and I'm gonna stay that way probably unless I get run over by a Jeep because we don't have to take this damn place. Funding for Iowa's World War II stories has been provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, generations of families and friends who feel passionate about Iowa Public Television programming. At Rockwell Collins, we're proud to support Iowa's veterans. Great ideas are created when we work together to build a heritage of innovation and connect with our communities. We never forget the fortunes of so many depend on our performance. Rockwell Collins. The Principal Financial Group, a proud supporter of the men and women who have sacrificed for America and the world. May their contributions never be forgotten. They announced over the speaker to man your, man your battles, battle stations. This is no blank. I'll let you fill that in yourself. And just as they got the last word out, I can remember very distinctly that a torpedo hit just as I was running down the steps down to go to my battle station down at the powder deck aboard the battleship. Gunner's mate Paul Ashbrenner was a 19-year-old sailor from Sumner who had joined the Navy the year before because there were no jobs available near his home. Ashbrenner had been assigned to the battleship USS Oklahoma. On Sunday, December 7, 1941, the Oklahoma was docked in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The attack began at 7.55 a.m. Hawaiian time. After the first torpedo struck the Oklahoma, the lights went out, and Ashbrenner found himself deep inside the ship in the dark. The ship started to list, started to turn over, and as it was turning over, I got about one or two decks up. I think the next deck was a shell deck. And I honestly could see in my heart that I could, couldn't possibly get out of there in my own strength. And I, I knew of the Lord, but I really didn't have him into my heart. But I asked him if he would spare my life, that I would dedicate my life over for him to use. And some miraculous way, I. I did get out, and as I was getting out of the overhang of the turret, the crude oil and water was coming in. The dive bombing and torpedo attacks lasted for a little more than an hour. For Ashbrenner and everyone else at Pearl Harbor, the attack had been a complete surprise. As the Japanese planes flew away, 2,500 American soldiers, sailors, and Marines were either dead or missing. Of the 525 Iowans at Pearl Harbor on that Sunday morning, 88 were either killed or never found. A few hours later, coordinated attacks by Imperial Japanese forces were carried out against American bases located on islands in the Pacific Ocean. Marine Corporal Glenn McDole from Urbandale was stationed at the Cavite Naval Base on the Philippine Islands. Locked in a battle that would last five months, McDole and his buddies soon came to the conclusion no reinforcements were coming to their rescue. We knew there was no way in Heaven Acres, after we'd heard what happened at Pearl Harbor, that we was going to get any help. Eventually, the larger Japanese force prevailed. An official surrender by American troops in the Philippines was announced on April 9th 1942. McDole fought on until May 6th. I'll tell you the most sick feeling you get when you look up and see old glory come down and a Japanese flag goes up. It just made you feel like a bunch of men without a, without a home. 
Army Corpsman Malcolm Amos of Afton was among those captured on April 9th. He became one of the more than 75,000 Allied forces, including an estimated 12,000 Americans who were forced to walk the 60 miles from the tip of Luzon Island to the American military base, Camp O'Donnell. For six days, the men marched north with no food or water on what became known as the Bataan Death March. Anyone who was injured, fell behind, or attempted to escape was killed. An estimated 10,000 men died. 5,000 of them were Americans. When we got into Camp O'Donnell, the rice was moldy, full of bugs, and maggots, and all that kind of stuff. And they cooked all that stuff up, and, and it was kind of like a porridge. And the guys looked at that, some of them looked at that, and said, well, I'm not eating that this kind of crap. And they just took and dumped her. And uh, those, uh, those people are still over, over there in the Philippines because they just starved to death because that's the only thing there was to eat. Both McDole and Amos eventually wound up at the Cabanatuan prison camp. But they didn't meet each other until years after the war. McDole, seeing the high death rate and lack of medical attention available to the men, volunteered for work details away from Cabanatuan. The work details finally took him to the Palawan prison camp on Palawan Island, where he helped build an airfield. We didn't classify. I'm Army or you're Marine. We were just all a bunch of good American fellas sticking together. And I don't believe, in fact, I know we were all closer than really brothers. Within days of the attack on Pearl Harbor, war was declared against what were now being called the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan. At the time, no one realized what kind of sacrifice would be required by those on the battlefront or the home front. When the war finally ended, most of the population of the world would be affected in one way or another. As the shock of the attacks in December wore off, the American government began mobilizing to fight back. Across the country, able-bodied men either volunteered or were drafted. Thousands of women joined the military or entered the workforce. Those men already in uniform were gathered and sent to attack the Axis powers. On November 8, 1942, Sergeant Elvin Moritz of Villisca was among the 160,000-man landing force of Operation Torch that attacked the North African country of Algiers. As part of the Iowa National Guard, Moritz had been on active duty since February of 1941 as a member of the 168th Infantry Regiment of the 34th Infantry Division. Nicknamed the Red Bull, the 34th was made up of National Guardsmen from Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. The men of the 34th were among the first to join with Allied forces from Britain, Canada, and Australia to fight back against the Axis powers. In battle, the British at uh, it was four o'clock in the afternoon, they just get out in a bunch, have tea, <laughs> have their tea. Everything quieted down. Germans quit shooting and nobody was shooting. Everything just quieted me. I think I had a half hour break. As soon as the time was up, they were shooting again. <laughs> as 1943 began, Allied forces suffered some setbacks. By February, after several months of fighting, Moritz and the rest of the 168's Company F had moved into northeastern Tunisia near the Fayyid Pass. Eventually, German forces managed to surround several companies of the 168 who were under the command of Major Robert Moore of Aliska. As the sun went down, the group formed two long columns and began to march out of the area. They had walked past several patrols of German soldiers when a lone sentry ordered them to halt. Moritz told the men to run, and the shooting began. We had gone right between 
two of our own half trucks the Germans had captured, and they were shooting at us with a 50 calibers. And of course, I was in the lead. And if you wanted to shoot across this way ahead of me, and he'd quit, and I wanted to shoot across the other way ahead of me, and I just zigzagging. Of the more than 900 men under Moore's command, 420 made it to the American lines. Moritz remembers 12 men, including Major Moore, escaping with him that night. I, for one, uh, was real curious, you know, about getting into actual combat. But after about the fourth day, no more, I was ready to come home. <laughs> Sergeant Aurelio Barron had left Valley Junction to join the military in February of 1941 and was assigned to the Red Bulls Company C of the 168 Infantry. During the battle for Faid Pass, Sergeant Barron's mortar squad was nearby perched on a hill, waiting to protect the retreating Allied troops. Barron began to survey the road below his position with binoculars. Unknown to Barron, German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, supreme commander of all German troops in Africa, was closer than he thought. I was a little small convoy and uh, coming up the road and, and turned right in, right in front of our, where we could see it. Like I said, it was about 400 yards or maybe away from us. And to this day, I say it was Rommel. It was uh, because of the uh, vehicles that it was in and, 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 and the uh, trademark with the cap and goggles. Next year, we hear that artillery is coming in. Right? Well, fortunately, they were shooting us, hitting over behind us, and they was, they was throwing that at us. And then you hear the clink lady clink and there were tanks and armored vehicles, and armored infantry. The company commander says, everybody for himself, you better get out of here. Back home in Iowa, the news from the battlefront was limited. The lack of information only served to deepen the worry for the families of the men in the 34th. In Montgomery County, that worry was intensified because a large percentage of the men from the area were fighting in Tunisia. As the battle raged on, 15-year-old Rex Holmes of Red Oak waited in the Western Union Telegraph office in the Red Oak Hotel. Des Moines, they signaled that they had traffic for Red Oak. Well, I knew how to operate the machine, so I turn, uh, turned around, flipped the switch, and told them to go ahead. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, that damn machine's still running. It's been running quite a while. And I went over and I picked up one, uh, the tape and run into a wastebasket. And I picked up the tape and started looking at it. I read two of them. And I, I knew right then and there we was in trouble. I thought they never would stop. None of the deliveries Holmes made that day would be happy ones. There was one lady here in town. She had three sons and a son-in-law. And she worked as a maid there at the hotel. And uh, when those things come in, I took the first two up. And of course, when she got the first one, she, she liked to have a fit. And then when the second one came, then she really got it. So and I had to get a doctor up there for her. By the end of the day, Holmes had delivered more than 60 telegrams to area families. At the end of the war, more men per capita had been lost from the Montgomery County area than from any other county in the United States. To help win the fight from the home front, the US government asked its citizens to increase production of everything from ammunition to food. Ed Tubbs of Delmer had just graduated from Iowa State College in December of 1941. Uh, I went to work in, in uh, Jasper County, lived in Newton for extension service. Uh, I was there for six months, and uh, it occurred to me that it was probably time to get involved, so I volunteered. Several months after enlisting, Tubbs' father Clifton became ill. Tubbs petitioned the federal government for a deferment, which would allow him to return to Delmer. Farmers fed the troops, so the request was granted. As far as balancing supply and demand, it wasn't getting done. 
until the war came along. Then, of course, demand exploded, and we suddenly needed to produce everything we could in order to feed the people, supply the armed forces, and so on. So we were uh, into production in big in a big way, as big a way as we could with the equipment we had. It was a uh, a tough time, tough time, really. Though farmers had been asked to produce as much as possible, it was still not enough to feed both a hungry nation and millions of people in the military. To help prevent a shortage for those in uniform, the federal government began to ration everything with a strategic value. Special coupon books were issued to every man, woman, and child in the United States. Without the coupon books, you could not buy certain items like sugar, meat, tires, or gasoline. I think every time uh, before the baby was, uh, was uh, wiped off, why they were, everybody was going to <laughs> sign him up for a ration card. And, uh, and you get one for the baby when he was born. Obviously, uh, uh, he wasn't able to use all the stuff that you could buy with those coupons. And those uh, coupon books were coveted. And uh, uh, as usual, you know, a lot of swapping going on. If some of you didn't, if you were, had a ration card for pickles and you didn't like pickles, you could trade it with somebody. In 1941, the United States was still recovering from the Great Depression. The jobless rate had been as high as 25%. Bankruptcy was not uncommon, and the standard of living for most Americans was 60% lower than before the stock market crash of 1929. When the war started, all that changed. More people were needed to produce the food and weapons for the men on the front lines. The new jobs were taken by many who had been out of work for several years. As more men were sent away to fight, women were hired to take over their positions on the assembly lines. Before World War II, women had generally been discouraged from working outside the home. Now they were being encouraged to take over jobs that had been traditionally considered men's work. Existing companies changed their lines from consumer goods to war materials, and new plants were constructed strictly for the creation of products for the war effort. In Ankeny, the Des Moines Ordnance Plant was already under construction when war was declared. By 1942, 30 and 50 caliber machine gun ammunition began to roll off the line. Gene Ursland of Ankeny, formerly Gene Gibson, was among the 19,000 people who worked at the facility. I think they gave us a, a short indoctrination as to what we were there for. And then they, they took us right to the working area. And I stayed in that same working area all the time that I was there. I think the patriotism came as, I, as it progressed and, that, and I was uh, thinking of going on into the service. After more than a year at the ordnance plant, Ursland joined the United States Marine Corps Women's Reserve. Following training at Camp Lejeune, she was assigned to Cherry Point, North Carolina, and worked as an aircraft engine mechanic. Maytag was one of the Iowa firms that stopped producing consumer goods and started making war supplies. In 1943, 19-year-old Hollis Pat Harrison from Albia, formerly Hollis Tarbell, had been working for a local dentist taking care of domestic chores. Harrison saw a newspaper advertisement placed by the Maytag Company in Newton. All the guys were doing something. They were fighting, going to service, enlisting, and what have you that we knew. And we thought it'd be a good idea for us to do something, too, while we could. And the money was good. The company, famous for its clothes washers, started making aircraft parts. Harrison was hired to make exhaust systems for B-26 Marauder bombers. To help finance the creation of war goods, the government began to offer bonds. The investment strategy was not lost on Maytag employees. Together, they purchased a B-26 Marauder for the war effort. For some, joining the service was a chance to relocate. Thelma Carden, formerly Sherman, was a 21-year-old native of Chelsea, Massachusetts, who joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps in November of 1942. The training was fantastic. I, I, it put me on my shoulders, told me what to do. I took everything in, what they had. 
and you, you didn't get to your your uh, like a corporal sergeant. You had to earn it, and they tested you on that every month in order to get more money. And I was getting seventy-eight dollars a month. Carden trained at the WAC base located at Fort Des Moines and earned the rank of technical sergeant. The training facility was the first of its kind for women in the United States. Because women were not allowed to be involved in combat, the WACs took stateside and foreign headquarters jobs that allowed men to fight the battles. Carden spent the duration of her service in Des Moines as a military policewoman. I was so proud to be in the, the parade grounds at the Fort Des Moines were oh, be just beautiful, everything. From the barracks on the Drake University campus, Carden would patrol the city of Des Moines with one other whack, armed with nothing more than a flashlight and limited training in hand-to-hand -hand combat. In November of 1943, Second Lieutenant Al Rolfus of Lamars was approaching Macon Island with his platoon. Now 24 years old, he had been drafted in February of 1942 and assigned to Company E, of the 165th Infantry Regiment of the 27th Infantry Division. We didn't know what was gonna happen. We'd never been in combat. We had so much naval gunfire. They pre-shelled that and strafed it with aircraft, the beach there that we were landing on. And I didn't think there could be a mosquito left there, you know. As his landing craft approached the beach, the boat's commander yelled final instructions to Rolfus. Then all of a sudden he yelled at me, he said, Lieutenant, you're gonna be on your own. And we were starting to slow down. We were touching reef, you know, we had a heavy load with a tank and everything. And uh, I, he dropped the ramp and I went head over heels in the water. Well, anyway, we, I came up spitting water and it was weightable, you know, it wasn't. And, uh, but we were, they were shooting at us out in the water too as we were heading in. Macon Island was captured in four days. Nearly 1,000 Americans were wounded, and more than 350 were killed. As the end of 1943 approached, the 34th Division was part of the force that pushed Axis troops out of Africa. Allied soldiers had moved across the Mediterranean Sea and were now on the Italian peninsula. Even with the heavy fighting, Greenfield native Sergeant Russell Bill Smith of the Red Bull's 133rd Infantry Regiment Company I was able to have an occasional respite from battle. I think in Italy once we were 76 days on the line was the longest, but usually about two months. And then we would get a 10 day off the line, and get uh, what they call care and cleaning of equipment, clean up all of our stuff, they have a big shower set up, big long shower, and you go in there and just shower to your heart's delight and come out to the other end with new clothes on, and, and then we'd get replacements. So we trained them for a few days, and then we'd go back up the front line again. By midsummer 1944, members of Company I were attacking German troops somewhere north of Rome, Italy. Bill Smith was returning to the battlefield after requesting an artillery barrage when he came upon a small patrol of five German soldiers that had made it behind the American lines. As the Germans prepared to shoot at the backs of Company I soldiers, Smith took his captured German Luger out of its holster. I seen him there, so that's when I stopped. And that's when I realized I didn't have a shell in the gun of my, or a shell in the barrel of my Luger. Well, at the Luger, I just threw up like that, and that clicked, and that's, that's when this German heard me when they clicked. I had a shell in the barrel in, and I had it on him just like that, you know. And uh, he decided that was a good time to quit being a soldier, I guess. <laughs> he looked around, of course, I had it right on him, and then he, he hollered at the rest of them, and they all threw up their hands, and dropped, their, dropped the weapons, and I marched them back. For saving the men in Company I, Smith was awarded the Silver Star. After landing on Saipan in June of 1944, now First Lieutenant Al Rolfus had dug in above Tanapeg Harbor. 
Japanese soldiers hiding nearby soon realized he was in charge and began to attack his position. So they knew I was the leader there because I was up and down the line checking the men and everything. Well, anyway, I heard this thump on the end of my foxhole, and I knew it was a grenade. And rather than roll, we had the, the parapet around the foxhole, it rolled out of my foxhole rather than into my foxhole, and it went off, and quite an explosion, of course, and two more right behind it. And uh, I still didn't, the other two men in my platoon didn't get hit either. In the skies over Italy, 24-year-old First Lieutenant Luther Smith of Des Moines was on his second tour of duty. As a member of the Tuskegee Airmen, officially known as the 332nd Fighter Group, Smith was eventually assigned to bomber escort duty in 1944. His job was to protect American bombers from German fighters. The Germans realized that these young black pilots stayed with the bombers and protected them very, very effectively. And the bomber crews realized that when they were escorted by these black aviators, they were going to get to their target safely and get back. And that was the really the beginning of racial equality when the white bomber crews realized these guys protecting them were every bit as good as anybody could be because they were able to carry out their mission successfully. On one mission over southern France, a German ME-109 fighter plane penetrated the flight of bombers Smith was sent to protect. He approached in his P-51 Mustang. And as I did, I was parallel with the German airplane, and I could see it was just a young person. He didn't have an oxygen mask on it, I could see his face. And I saw it was just a youth. And to me, it appeared to be about a 16 or 17-year-old youth. And I couldn't imagine I was up there going to shoot down somebody who was just a, a boy. But I had my job to do, so I said, well, I'm going to take the airplane out. And I shot the airplane, and it went down. During his tour of duty, Smith shot down two German fighter planes and destroyed 10 German aircraft on the ground. By the end of the war, the 332nd had performed 200 escort missions without the loss of a single bomber. Later that same year, after 132 successful missions, Smith met with trouble. The bomber escort mission he was assigned to had been uneventful. While the pilots in his squadron were returning to base, they were shooting at train cars and airplanes on the ground. It was Friday the 13th of October, 1944. Near Balaton, Hungary, not far from Budapest, Smith was shooting at some rail cars and one of them exploded. Smith was forced to fly through the cloud of debris and his airplane was severely damaged. As he attempted to bail out, the plane went into a tailspin and his right foot got caught inside the cockpit. The airplane was on fire and I said to myself, so this is how guys go. I was caught in the airplane and I wasn't gonna be able to make it. Smith eventually got out of his airplane, came to rest in a tree, and was captured by German soldiers. After some major surgery in German hospitals, he spent the next seven months in a prison camp. In April of 1944, 27-year-old Second Lieutenant Ray Schleis of Johnston was starting his overseas tour of duty. Schleis had joined the Army Air Corps in March of 1942 and was now piloting B-17 Flying Fortresses from a base in Framlingham, England. He had left his wife Vivian earlier that month to complete his 30 required missions, all in a span of just 90 days. On his first mission, April 18, 1944, Schleis was sent to bomb a Henkel aircraft plant 25 miles north of Berlin. As he approached the target, the air became thick with shrapnel from exploding anti-aircraft shells, what the bomber crews called flak. The shells, we could see them break around outside and hear the shrapnel hit the airplane. You know, it sounded like popcorn in a popper. 
Even though Schley's airplane was hit before getting to the target, he was able to drop his bomb load. Unknown to the crew, a piece of flak had lodged in one of the engines. After the bombs were dropped, the damaged engine began to run out of control. I decided somewhere as we were moving along between Orenburg and Hamburg that I'd leave the formation, go off to the side, and use something that the guy had mentioned about getting rid of a prop. So we dove, the, we, I got my, nav, my uh, co-pilot on the stick and we pushed the airplane down, nose down, up to about 190, and then we pull back. And we did that five times. And all of a sudden, the, the, I knew the prop was going because next to the last time it was laying over like that, still spinning out there. And it, and it just went down, went under. With the propeller gone, Schleis was able to return to England and land safely. During some of the breaks between flying missions, there was time for relaxation and, of course, letter writing, the most common long-distance communication device of the day. Back in Iowa, Schley's wife Vivian would hurry home from her factory job at the Solar Aircraft Company in Des Moines to see if any letters had arrived. I know that I would rush home from work each day hoping there would be a letter there, but if one wasn't there, I didn't really worry. I figured, well, maybe next day there would be one. Dear wife, today four more letters arrived, three from good old USA and one from Wade. Guess, darling, you have read quite a bit about each day's doings in the local paper. And it usually involves us, of course. That's what we're over here for, to do as much damage to the enemy as possible. After two years and six months of fighting by U.S. forces, Allied commanders gave the order to begin the invasion of Europe. Officially called Operation Overlord, troops were to storm the beaches of Normandy, France, on what would become known as D-Day, June 6, 1944. Technician fourth grade Verl Buck, a 21-year-old from Jubilee, had been drafted in January of 1943 and was now a part of the 149th Combat Engineer Battalion. As the assault began, Buck was in one of three lines of specially designed boats called Landing Craft Tanks, or LCTs. The lines of LCTs stretched beyond the horizon back towards England. Their destination was Omaha Beach, one of five landing areas on the coast of Normandy. Buck was in the first wave of soldiers to hit the beach, when the front ramp of the landing craft went down, Buck and the other soldiers raced ashore. They had us pinned down. We couldn't get out of there. We couldn't, you'd stick your helmet above. They'd shoot a hole through it. It was hectic. It wasn't orderly. It was, it was too many. Your, the leaders got shot up, killed, wounded. And everybody, did, then after they got after a while, then everybody got kind of organized a little bit amongst themselves and, and knew they had to go because there was no way you could swim that English Channel. You had, you had to go. Finally, a group of German soldiers blocking their advance were killed by gunfire from a ship in the channel, and the men were able to move forward. Omaha Beach saw the heaviest fighting of all the landing zones. An estimated 34,000 men landed on Omaha Beach that morning. At the end of the battle, 2,000 were listed as either killed, wounded, or missing in action. The attacks on June 6 were devastating to the Axis powers. German forces were eventually pushed back to the Ardennes Forest in eastern France. Ruth Miller, formerly Ruth Smith, a 22-year-old nurse from Marshalltown, had joined the Army in May of 1943. Then the more we heard about the war, I began to think that maybe it would be a good place to be involved and do my part. After being commissioned as a second lieutenant, Miller was assigned to the 110th Evacuation Hospital and sent to Europe. The 110th's job 
was to set up near the battlefront, bandage wounded soldiers, and if necessary, perform surgery. After treatment, the soldiers would be transported to hospitals farther from the battle. The 110th went to England in June of 1944. Miller's first assignment was the penicillin team. At the time, penicillin was a new miracle drug that had to be mixed just before use. We just went around every four hours, and if they were sleeping, we had to wake them up. <laughs> and the boys said, we almost rather go back and face the German than you people coming around stabbing us every <laughs> four hours, but it saved so many lives, and it was good. In one last attempt to get Allied forces out of Europe, Adolf Hitler ordered his army to counterattack in December of 1944. During this last desperate move, the German army pushed 60 miles into Allied territory. The assault became known as the Battle of the Bulge. The name was given to this pivotal encounter because the front line looked like a bulge on battlefield maps. Earlier, during the month of September, the 110th evacuation hospital had moved to Luxembourg and set up a field hospital in the town of Esch. Ruth Miller, unaware of the events unfolding nearby, was preparing for a New Year's Eve party along with other nurses from the 110th. As the men were brought in, Miller's belief that her work involved more than just the treatment of physical wounds was reinforced. They were so happy to see somebody from home from America, and it boosted their morale, and uh, that we were there to take care of them. And I'm sure it made them think of their own girlfriends and wives and mothers too, you know. And uh, it was just really a good feeling to know that you were there to help them out and try and boost their morale because, oh, what they went through, I just, Suffering was awful. They say war is hell, but I, I say it's devastating, it's cruel, it's just terrible. Private First Class Dean Lettington, a 19-year-old from Des Moines, had crossed the English Channel with other units of the 7th Army 17 days after D-Day. As part of the 559th Field Artillery Battalion, he had spent the last few months fighting across France. By late December, his unit was getting close to the growing bulge in the line. As the German forces began to push forward, the order to withdraw was given. After spotting German tanks, the men of the 559th were more than willing to comply with their orders and fall back. To get out of there, we had to go between two big stone buildings. And uh, we actually seen those tanks fire at us. As we were sitting on that truck, the Lord was with us. Instead of firing into our convoy, they fired into these buildings, trying to get a cave in. All of a sudden, it was got sprinkled with rocks from the building, you know, but nothing really severe. But then later we realized that, yeah, they didn't want to destroy our convoy. They wanted our ammunition, gasoline, and possibly our guns if we didn't get them exploded. In January of 1945, 22-year-old John Phillips of Waterloo was part of a group of replacement troops sent to the 106th Infantry Division fighting the Battle of the Bulge. The winter of 1944 and 45 in, in Europe was one of the worst winters they have ever had. It was bitterly cold. There was snow up to our, our knees and our hips. And we were, for 24 days, we were on the attack and never once got inside. We were sleeping in foxholes. And we had not been issued uh, winter footwear, so we, we were losing as many men with frozen feet and frozen ankles and frozen legs as we were from enemy gunfire. First Lieutenant Phillips, who had just become the executive officer for Company E of the 424th Infantry Regiment, 
had spent the last 24 days pushing the German troops back to where the battle had begun. After taking the town of Medel, Belgium, Phillips took a small group of men just beyond where most of his unit was camped. There, he began directing the placement of two machine guns to protect against a German counterattack. Suddenly, we had walked into a German ambush. They were behind us, they were around us, they were in the trees, they were in the bushes. They were firing from every direction. And I got hit f five times, three times in the stomach. Once uh, uh, shattered my left bicep and once in this Bible. The fifth bullet was lodged in the Bible and uh, that probably was the one that uh, saved my life that day. Phillips was captured, sent to a frontline German field hospital for surgery, and then forced to walk 15 miles to a prison camp near Koblenz, Germany. The worst thing they did was to hold a pistol to my head and tell me, you know, we can shoot you at this point and nobody will ever know what happened to you. And that was actually our worst fear that they would do this because nobody knew where I was and they could have shot me and buried me and nobody ever would have known what happened to me. After five days and still suffering from his wounds, Phillips was loaded into a crowded boxcar and sent to Hamelburg, Germany. He was still wearing the same bullet riddled uniform. When Phillips arrived, he joined 1,500 other officers being held in one area of the camp. With no tasks or odd jobs to perform, the time passed slowly. Meals totaled 500 calories per day and included weak coffee, a grass-based soup, and black bread made mostly from sawdust. The morale was terribly low. Everybody was, they were, they were sick and uh, uh, about all they did, 1,500, can you imagine 1,500 American officers sitting around all day long and most of the time they were making up recipes and, and, uh, and uh, menus because they were all going to start restaurants when they got back because they wanted to have a lot of food around. Meanwhile, at the Palawan Island prison camp, Glenn McDowell had been working as a slave laborer in squalid conditions for three years. Along with the other men in the camp, he had endured lack of food, primitive living conditions, and constant beatings from the guards. We had seen some fellows take beatings that uh, citizens of today cannot imagine what kind of beatings they took. They took great pride in uh, beating you. So we had one. One guy in the camp called the Bull. He was a Japanese, looked like a sumo wrestler. He took great pleasure in trying to see how quick he could knock a man out by hitting him in the head. In late 1944, fearing an American invasion, Japanese commanders made the decision to kill the prisoners in Palawan. In November, McDole and the other prisoners were ordered to dig three trenches and several pits as bomb shelters. What the prisoners were actually doing was digging their own graves. On December 14th, a false air raid was signaled by the Japanese guards, and the executions began. Then they came into the camp hollering, get in your trenches, get in your trenches. Americans are coming, Americans are coming. Well, as hysterical as they were, we knew we'd better get down there calm. And we got down in there. I stood in the opening of our trench and kept the men informed what was happening. Next thing you see, this bunch of Japanese come into the prison camp carrying nothing but buckets and torches. Came up the trench A and in went the buckets of gas and torches. And out came guys screaming and hollering human torches. During previous air raids, the men in McDowell's trench had been planning an escape through a tunnel they'd dug. The tunnel led to the edge of a cliff and a 60-foot drop to the beach below. When the Japanese threw the gasoline into the first trench, McDowell, along with all the men in his shelter, escaped through the tunnel. After several days and nights of evading capture, McDowell swam seven miles across open water to another part of the island. He was eventually found by Filipino natives 
and evacuated in January of 1945. Only 11 of the 150 prisoners in the camp that day escaped with their lives. Once survivors were picked up by U.S. forces, plans were made to rescue the other prisoners of war held by the Japanese. In early 1945, 20-year-old Galen Kittleson from St. Ansgar was stationed in the Philippines as part of an elite unit called the Alamo Scouts. The Scouts were made up of small, highly trained units that operated behind Japanese battle lines gathering information about enemy forces. Kittleson's unit was selected to carry out reconnaissance on the Cabanatuan prison camp in anticipation of a rescue attempt. The camp was 30 miles behind enemy lines. I was really the first one to see it, but, but it was across an open field, too, because the, the Japanese had those prisoners um, growing stuff out there for the camp. With members of the 6th Ranger Battalion, an attack was planned. And on January 30th, 1945, as the sun went down, the battle began. And when we got to right close to the fence, a gong started going. And we thought, my God, they, they know we're here. But it was sailors in that POWs that had each night, they run the eight o'clock, seven o'clock, you know, like they do on ships. I know it was noisy as all heck, right when they attacked it, of course because the Rangers really done a super job. They got that gate open and, and those suckers really poured in there. I didn't fire around there, because uh, I didn't have to. My job was to get those prisoners to the river. So I guided them. Sometimes you had to almost grab a hold of them to keep them going the right direction, but they got there. P.F.C. Kittleson was awarded a Bronze Star for his participation in the raid. On the day of the raid, Malcolm Amos was already planning his escape from Cabanatuan. When the fighting began, Amos thought it was Filipino guerrillas firing at the Japanese guards. The bullets started to go through the shack where we, we was in, so we just slid out of there, and there was a ditch out beside it. Then all at once it quit and quit fire. And there was guys running around there and said, we're, uh, the rangers, we're getting you out of here, go to the main gate. With the help of Filipino citizens, 511 men were rescued and taken to the American lines. Private First Class Henry Leonard, a 20-year-old draftee from Ryan, was sent to fight in the Philippines in January of 1945. He was assigned to the Bushmasters, a group of National Guardsmen from Arizona, officially known as the 158th Regimental Combat Team. Mosquitoes were terrible. We were always covered up with, with mosquito dope. We'd just put it right on our clothes and on our face. And, and uh, we had a bath uh, if we came to a river. But other than that, you wore the same clothes. The same you wore the same clothes anyway. You washed them in the river if you had a, or unless you went back to a rest area, you washed them in the river and hung them on a bush, and that's the way you lived. During one mission, PFC Leonard was put into a squad with Corporal Schmidt and PFC Young. Leonard didn't even know the first names of the two young men he was fighting with that day. As the men went into action. Schmidt began to point at places where he believed enemy soldiers were hiding. A Japanese sniper watching the action shot and killed him. Leonard and Young took cover behind a hut. Well, Smitty was out there, and Smitty wasn't going to stay out there. <coughs> so... All I said to Young was, let's go get him. And we shucked off our field packs and our ammunition belts and, and our rifles. 
And we took off and ran out there and grabbed him under the arms and dragged him back and behind the hut. And uh, because we had a, a sort of an un, unspoken law amongst us, like the, I guess you would call it a band of brothers. Anyway, you're, the people you meet there and are in combat with are closer than anybody you're ever gonna meet again. But uh, we were never gonna leave anybody behind. They were always gonna go home. Whether they were dead or alive, they went, their body went home. And Smitty went home. Henry Leonard was awarded the Bronze Star for bringing Corporal Schmidt's body back from the front. Between battles, soldiers had a limited amount of time to think about loved ones, home, or the future. But on the battlefront, they were careful not to dwell too long on anything other than fighting the enemy. In my, my case, I was a Catholic, and I would say the rosary. And then you might think about occasionally about, God, I wish I was home and, and uh, was married. And... <coughs> normal people things, you know? But that didn't last very long because you had to, you had to have your attention all the time on, on the trail or out in, what's out in front of you. You didn't have much time to think about anything else, staying alive. Near the end of April 1945, Dean Leddington's unit had been moving across Germany without much difficulty. As his artillery company approached Munich, they were stopped and ordered to await instructions. The Dachau concentration camp, located nearby, had just been liberated. So then they let us go in and see what tragedies we've seen. And it didn't take long to get me infuriated. I was just, I was just crazy mad. And I come to this one building where the prisoners would bill it. And so I just, there's three of us there together. And I just kicked the door in. You know, I didn't bother to open I just kicked it in. In the far right-hand corner of that building, I seen something move. So I immediately had my carbine and I eased my way down there, and this little old person scunched way down in the corner, just shaking like a leaf. Then he recognized the American uniforms and uh, calmed him down a little bit. On May 8, 1945, Germany surrendered. On August 6, an atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. On August 9th, a second atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki. The unprecedented destruction helped bring about the unconditional surrender of the Japanese imperial government on August 15, 1945. On September 2, 1945, representatives of the Japanese Imperial Government surrendered to General Douglas MacArthur on board the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Henry Leonard, who had been appointed to MacArthur's honor guard in May, was not on duty that day, but he was at the ceremony. On board one of the ships next to the Missouri, Leonard had climbed to one of the highest spots possible to get a better view. I thought, man, alive, I'm still alive and I'm gonna stay that way probably unless I get run over by a Jeep because we don't have to take this damn place. I don't think, I don't think we had enough of men in America anymore to take the Japanese, take Japan or Kyoto or, or any of those islands. I don't think we had the power because they would have, the women and children and everybody else would have had sharpened bamboo poles, if nothing else, and they'd have fought us to the last man. After three years, eight months, and eight days, the fighting for American forces was over. In the United States, there was dancing in the streets, long parades, and colossal victory celebrations. Soon, the focus could change from sacrificing to rebuilding. Sixteen million Americans had been sent to war. 
406,000 never returned. It was a long time before I was able to hear a taps at any memorial service or hear taps at all because of the memories of, that I had with that. But I have overcome that. But it just brings back those Russian memories. Funding for Iowa's World War II stories has been provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, generations of families and friends who feel passionate about Iowa Public Television programming. At Rockwell Collins, we're proud to support Iowa's veterans. Great ideas are created when we work together to build a heritage of innovation and connect with our communities. We never forget the fortunes of so many depend on our performance. Rockwell Collins. The Principal Financial Group, a proud supporter of the men and women who have sacrificed for America and the world. May their contributions never be forgotten.